round window the round window also called the fenestra cochlea is one of two openings in the middle ear at the level of the cochlea allowing communication between the mesotympanum of the middle ear and the inner ear it vibrates with opposite face to vibrations from the inner ear producing movement of perilymph in the cochlea it is located at the bottom of a funnel shaped depression called the round window niche and measures approximately 2 to 3 mm long and 1.5 mm wide it is sealed by a membrane called the secondary tympanic membrane also called the round window membrane and this sometimes can be seen on a high resolution ct now when we look into the middle ear via an endoscope this is the long prosopyncus this is the stapedial tendon the foot plate of the stap is the crure and the foot plate getting inserted into the oval window this is the cauda tympanae the tensor tympanae muscle the promontory and in front and inferiorly is the round window niche and that is closed by the secondary tympanic membrane or the round window membrane and when we go inside this is the round a very rare picture this is the round window membrane sealing off the round window applied we now have what is called the silverstein microwick that is for treating inner ear diseases such as meniere's and sudden sensorineural hearing loss autoimmune inner ear disease and tinnitus in this the antibiotic gentamicin is an effective method of relieving attacks of meniere's erstwhile in 80% of patients and these results have been obtained using what is called a microwick which is placed through a tiny tube through the ear drum in the ear drum and then the microwick passes via the grommet and then rests on the round window membrane and thereby introduces medications into the inner ear this is dr silvas we have uh, sudden deafness and we want to get steroids into the inner ear when we give it by mouth it does go into the inner ear but in low concentrations to get it in high concentration we have to deliver the steroids directly to the inner ear and the only way to do that is to have an opening in the eardrum because if you just put the drops in the ear they bounce off the eardrum they're not going anywhere so about 20 years ago i developed this uh, microwick procedure it was a little wick that goes in through the eardrum and through a little tube that i put in the eardrum the patient is awake and we anesthetize the ear with some novocaine we put the tube in place and they put the drops in the ear canal three times a day and the wick swells up and delivers the medication right to the inner ear to the round window membrane which is like the cornea of the eye and absorbs the steroids and goes directly into the inner ear so that is done for a month and then afterwards we just take the tube and the wick out in the office and patch it with a little piece of paper and that's the end of it and have uh... the round window serves as a boundary between the basal turn of the cochlea anteriorly and the round window niche posteriorly it along with the oval window is one of two natural openings between the inner and middle ear the round window is often overshadowed by the oval window and sometimes the pathologic third windows namely superior semicircular canal dehiscence nevertheless numerous numerous developmental acquired neoplastic and iatrogenic processes can affect the round window membrane and niche any of these can cause conductive hearing loss because occlusion of the round window prevents propagation of acoustic energy along the cochlear axis in operative interventions in which primary goal of surgery is to improve conductive hearing loss or access the round window region for cochlear implantation accurate preoperative identification of round window abnormalities is essential to first determine whether surgery is a worthwhile endeavor and subsequently the to guide the surgical strategy in this article the various pathologic entities and surgical considerations of the round window that can be encountered on imaging 
are reviewed. Physiology and functionality. The inner ear windows refer to openings in the otic capsule that connect the fluid in the inner ear to either the middle ear or intracranial space. The two primary natural openings are the oval and round window. Other windows include the cochlea and vestibular aqueduct and tiny foramina that transmit vessels and nerves to the inner ear and adjacent structures. The role of oval and round window is related to sound transmission. Vibratory acoustic energy enters through the oval window, is transmitted through the cochlea and exits into the middle ear cavity via the round window. The fluid in the cochlea through which sound is transmitted is functionally incompressible due to the surrounding osseous structures. Movement of cochlear fluid is thereby dependent on the mobility of the round and oval window membranes. Inward displacement of the oval window membrane via the stapes by ossicular vibration is matched by outward round window membrane displacement. Anatomy The round window is located along the posterior aspect of the cochlear promontory and measures about 1.5 to 2.1 mm horizontally, 1.9 mm vertically and 0.6 mm in thickness. The round window membrane is thicker along its edges and thinner in the middle and is made up of three layers, two epithelial layers facing the inner and middle ear respectively and a connective tissue core. Contrary to its name, the shape of the round window is typically skewed or ovoid and non-planar according to a recent study. The round window niche is primarily defined by relatively thin overhanging bone that naturally extends from the promontory. This overhanging bone may obscure complete direct visualization of the round window membrane during routine middle ear surgery and cochlear implantation. In addition, most ears have a thin layer of mucosa covering the round window membrane, often called a pseudomembrane that blocks direct visualization of the window if not removed. Now, this is a surface rendered image of micro CT of the temporal bone showing the relationship of the round window niche that is the round window niche to the adjacent anatomic structures. Now here we see the lateral semicircular canal that is the image of the lateral semicircular canal the facial nerve here traversing across is a facial nerve that is the lateral semicircular canal the stapes and the oval window and the cochlear promontory. Again CT normal round window anatomy. This is the coronal view, the stenverse view, posh p o s c h l view. The image is centered on the round window membrane and that shows the straight white arrow shows the round window membrane situated between the basal turn of the cochlea which is a black arrow and the round window niche which is a curved white arrow. Again the straight white arrow is a round window membrane, the basal turn of the cochlea and the round window niche. The oval window is adjacent and that is the dashed arrow that you see that is the oval window. Round window stenosis and atresia. Round window absence is a rare abnormality that may be seen in conjunction with various syndromes including incomplete partition anomalies, mandibulofacial dystosis and coloboma of the eye heart defects, atresia of the coenae, retardation of growth and or development, genital and or urinary abnormalities and ear abnormality and deafness that is a charge syndrome. In addition to cases of oral atresia, round window stenosis and atresia. In very rare cases, it may also occur without an associated syndrome. Some authors have posited that such non-syndromic cases may represent an inherited autosomal dominant genetic disorder with variable penetrance. Even in non-syndromic cases, few reports exist of round window atresia 
as an isolated finding. Most of these patients have associated midlia or pinna abnormalities. Now here, this is a picture of a 5 year old girl CT high definition with round window atresia in the setting of the charge syndrome. Now A, B, C are images of the temporal bone which demonstrate complete absence of the round window. Complete absence of the round window. There is no round window here. The round window niche is hypoplastic and surrounded by dense bone adjacent to the sinus tympani. Multiple ab other abnormalities are following. The stapes is dysmorphic with absence of neck, crura and foot plate. The oval window is absent. The facial nerve canal is diminutive and inferiorly displaced. This is a picture of a 10 year old girl which demonstrate ossification at the expected location of the round window membrane. Where the round window membrane should have been there is total ossification and the patient had no known syndromic association. Patients with round window atresia typically have a mixed but predominantly conductive hearing loss with an associated typical airborne gap of 30 to 40 decibels. So when we come across a patient with a 30-40 dB conductive hearing loss, we must also keep in mind the possibility of round window atresia. Attempts to surgically create the round window do not always produce substantial gains in hearing. And the reasons remain uncertain because few such surgical case reports exist. However, the inconsistent results may be related to the presence of associated anomalies such as congenital stapes fixation, autosclerosis or reossification following an operation. Unfortunately, because surgeons often have incomplete exposure of the round window niche during routine autologic procedures and because of its rarity, round window atresia can easily be overlooked intraoperatively. It is also is frequently missed on imaging and many patients with round window atresia are not diagnosed until middle ear exploration. Close attention must therefore be paid to the morphology of round window and round window niche on imaging performed for conductive or mixed hearing loss. Stenosis of the round window membrane or recess is more common than complete round window absence. Like round window atresia, stenosis of the round window can have syndromic associations and contribute to hearing loss. The low element of normal size for the round window is generally cited as 1.5 millimeters. Nevertheless, imaging characteristic of stenotic recesses can be quite variable, ranging from mild to severe. Here is a 52 year old woman with bilateral profound hearing loss. Images reveal the temporal bone demonstrates advanced stenosis of the round window. Advanced stenosis of the round window. Acquired abnormalities. Acquired abnormalities that affect the round window include a range of traumatic, inflammatory and iatrogenic processes. Otitis media associated with mucosal thickening and effusion may obscure the round window or adjacent niche. Less commonly, barotrauma or increased pressure may cause the round window membrane to rupture leading to perilum fistula with sensineural hearing loss and vertigo. Temporal bone fractures through the round window may disrupt the membrane. Several primary osseous processes such as Peges disease, fibrous dysplasia, autocephalus and osteogenesis imperfecta can affect the temporal bone including the annular ring of the round window. Several of the most common causes of acquired abnormalities of the round window we will discuss. Here is a 48 year old woman who complained of fullness in the right ear with conductive hearing loss following a bout of flu like symptoms. CT revealed a tiny focus of debris adjacent to the round window membrane within the round window niche. 
possibly a sequelae of a recent inflammatory disease. A tiny focus of debris adjacent to the round window membrane was causing her uh, symptoms of fullness and conductive hearing loss following a bout of flu-like symptoms. Labyrinthine ossificans refers to ossification within the membranous labyrinth most frequently occurring within the scalar tympani. Labyrinthine ossificans is secondary to inflammatory changes from infections such as suppurative otitis media, labyrinthitis, meningitis or through trauma and autosclerosis have also been indicated. Labyrinthine ossification associated with bacterial meningitis, the basal turn of the cochlea is often preferentially affected because infection may spread from the subarachnoid space through the cochlear aqueduct to the proximal scalar tympani and in some cases labyrinthine ossificans may involve the round window involvement thought to occur when the inciting event is otitis media or meningitis that spreads through the round window along the scalar tympani. Etiology of labyrinthine ossificans cannot be predicted on the basis of mineralization patterns and labyrinthine ossification is associated with the development of sensorineural hearing loss and may render cochlear implant more challenging and outcomes less re rewarding. Extensive labyrinthine ossificans may preclude the placement of a cochlear implant. Expected CT findings of labyrinthine ossificans involving the round window include thickening, attenuation along the membrane likely with coexistent ossific material in the basal turn of the cochlea or elsewhere in the membranous labyrinth. In early stages of labyrinthitis, fibrosis may be evident only on heavily weighted T2 imaging where low signal is seen within or partially replacing normally high signal perilymph. This is a case of labyrinthine ossificans. The CT shows ossifications in the basal tone of the cochlea and with mineralization of the round windows window. Autosclerosis. Autosclerosis is an acquired condition in which spongiotic bone replaces mature enchondral bone of the otic capsule. I repeat, autosclerosis is an acquired condition in which spongiotic bone replaces mature endochondral bone of the otic capsule. Typically, autosclerosis involves the oval window and stapes footplate in the region of the fissula antifenestrum. Fenestral autosclerosis may also secondary involve the round window in approximately 3% of cases. Isolated round window autosclerosis has been reported though the prevalence is rare. Secondary involvement of or isolated involvement of the round window by autosclerosis is an important radiologic observation because it portends a poorer chance of surgical success. Specifically, round window involvement diminishes the moment of perilymph fluid following stepidectomy and process of placement, the surgery which is typically used in case of autosclerosis. The appearance of autosclerosis on imaging depends on the disease phase. In the active phase, which is the autospongiotic stage, the affected bone surrounding the round window will appear loosened and demineralized. And later on, these areas are replaced by sclerotic bone during the non-active autosclerotic stage. As this replacement occurs, the round window membrane may become thickened or irregular and heaped up osseous plaques may narrow the round window or the adjacent niche. Now here is a case of autosclerosis with round window involvement. The CT shows bony changes compatible with autosclerosis adjacent to the round window with marked narrowing of the round window niche. This marked narrowing of the round window niche and it, the findings are compatible with autosclerosis adjacent to the round window. Mansoor categorized autosclerosis of the round window on the basis of extent of involvement of the membrane and adjacent structures and under this classification Round window 1 represented hypodensities above the round window edge. RW2 had partial thickening of the membrane and RW3 showed global membrane thickening with persistent air filled recesses. RW4 had obliteration of the recess and finally RW5 demonstrated overgrowth of the autosclerotic foci. Predictably higher grades of round window involvement 
were found to be associated with more severe hearing loss likely related to Im increased impedance within the scalar tympani. Jugular bulb dehiscence. The positional anatomy of the jugular bulb is variable throughout a person's life and jugular bulb abnormalities consequently develop with time and are typically acquired by the fourth decade of life. High riding jugular bulbs are found in approximately 8% of patients both on pathologic specimens and CT images. Dehiscent jugular bulbs and jugular bulb diverticula are more rare occurring at a rate of about 2.6%. High riding jugular bulbs, dehiscent ju bulbs and jugular diverticula are often asymptomatic. They may also present with pulsatile tinnitus or less commonly conductive hearing loss, likely related to encroachment by the bulb on the round window, ossicular chain or tympanic membrane. The instance in which the round window membrane is specifically involved is rare. Histologic analysis of temporal bone identified only two such cases in 1,579 specimens studied. Now, this is a case of a jugular bulb anomaly and the CT shows bony margins overlying the jugular bulb within the middle ear are markedly thinned compatible with dehiscences. These white arrows show compatible with dehiscences as a consequence of the jugular bulb anomalies. Imaging findings vary on the basis of the type of jugular bulb abnormality. High riding bulbs typically occur as an isolated finding in which the dome of the jugular bulb is within 2 mm of the internal artery canal flow. A high riding bulb may extend further supralaterally, eroding the sigmoid plate and protrude into the middle cavity. This dehiscence is best seen on CT as thinning or absence of bone between the bulb and middle ear structures. Diverticular will appear as distinct outpouchings from the bulb. Any jugular bulb anomaly seen on CT should be closely examined for the presence of abutment of the bulb on the round window membrane, niche or other middle ear structures. Neoplastic processes. Several neoplastic processes may affect the round window membrane or round window niche. Such Metastasis and primary osseous tumors are centered in the bone. Secondary round window involvement by these lesions depend on their size and location. Notably, most primary osteodystrophies and osseous neoplasms spare the otic capsule given divergent embryology and composition. Other tumors have an anatomic proclivity to involve the round window membrane. For example, intralabyrinthine schwannomas may extend through the round window membrane into the niche. CT images of such patients may demonstrate a soft tissue mass within the niche and visualization of the entire lesion often requires MR imaging. Now this shows intralabyrinthine schwannoma with involvement of the round window. The CT shows the mass extending through the round window membrane into the round window niche. The mass extending into the round window niche. Jugular tympanic paragangliomas comprising glomus jugular and glomus tympanicum tumors may also involve the round window. Glomus tympanicum tumors arise from the tympanic nerve and grow within and along the cochlear promontory. If large enough, they may extend into and occlude the round window niche. Glomus jugular tumors begin within the jugular foramen and although histologically benign, glomus jugular tumors are locally destructive and can erode into the adjacent middle ear structures such as the round window niche. Here we see the glomus jugular tumor with round window obstruction and the image shows of the right temporal bone showing a permeative destructive mass centered in the jugular foramen. Permeating a destructive mass centered in the jugular foramen which extends into the right middle ear fills the round window niche, opacification of the niche extending up to the round window membrane. Surgical concentrations. 
surgical access and round window visualization. Several conditions may require surgical dissection of the round window niche. Most commonly the niche is accessed during cochlear implantation. Most cases are performed using a standard cortical mastoidectomy with facial recess. The bony overhang of the round window niche is then drilled to allow direct round window membrane visualization during electrode insertion. Conversely, when the surgical access of the round window niche is performed to treat infectious or neoplastic media processes, the region is typically visualized via a transcranial approach. In addition, there are uncommon situations in which the round window occlusion is performed to treat traumatic perilum fistula or superior canal dehiscence syndrome. In these cases, the middle ear is typically accessed via a transcanal approach. The round window is visualized with an operative microscope or endoscope and fascia with or without cartilage is packed into the round window niche. Recently, endoscopes have gained popularity in autologic surgery. An endoscopy allows superior visualization around corners, particularly during removal of cholestatoma in the sinus tympani and anterior epitympanum. And thus, endoscopes are sometimes used to augment microscopic techniques in complex cases. However, for visualizing and access of the round window, the use of an endoscope does not carry a substantial advantage over microscope visualization in most cases because the round window niche is readily seen when performing either a transcanal or a transmastoid facial recess surgery via a direct line of sight. Postoperative changes in third window lesions. Third window lesions refer to any range of pathology that creates an abnormal connection between the inner ear and either the middle ear or the intracranial cavity. Acoustic energy is lost to the windows, often causing a so-called pseudoconductive hearing loss, which manifests as increased bone and decreased air conduction. There are many such conditions, vestibular aqueduct enlargement, semicircular canal dehiscence, and any other type of osseous thinning between the inner ear and adjacent vascular or numerous channels. Patients can present with Tullio phenomenon that is vertigo symptoms induced by loud noises or the Hennebert sign similar symptoms induced by increase in pressure within the ear canal due to deflection of the superior canal cupola by endolymphatic fluid escaping the osseous defect. For cases of superior canal dehiscence, surgical plugging of the pathologic osseous defect can be completed either via middle cranial force or craniotomy or a transmastoid approach. Alternately, the round window can be targeted. Surgeons may reinforce the round window with overlying tissue that is fascia, cartilage or fat or occlude the round window niche. Currently, most authors favor the former approach in which although the round window occlusion is considered low risk, this strategy may induce conductive hearing loss. Furthermore, the theoretic physiologic justification for this approach is lacking because occlusion of the round window should theoretically create preferential shunting towards the pathologic third window. Cochlear implants. Cochlear implant may be inserted through a cochleostomy adjacent to the round window or directly through the round window membrane. Most surgeons surveyed preferred the former approach though these decisions may be based on histologic presumptions. Early multi-channel leads early multi-channel leads were thought to traumatize the cochlea if placed through the round window. A more recent survey found that today most surgeons prefer round window membrane electrode insertions given the natural and less traumatic access provided to the scalar tympani, the preferred location of the electrode placement. A recent study found no difference in the number of audiometric outcomes or post-operative complications among groups undergoing electrode placement via either approach. However, most cochlear implant surgeons now prefer the round window approach when trying to preserve any residual natural acoustic hearing. Regardless of cochlear entry point, complications do occur. The electrode can kink, flip over at its tip or migrate. Postoperative imaging can also demonstrate various degrees of electrode displacement, including within the semicircular canal, internal carotid artery, internal auditory canal and vestibule. 
Across time, electrodes may also migrate from the initial position and post-operative images should be evaluated in the context of the surgical approach that is via round window or adjacent cochlear stimuli and should include an assessment of electrode position, integrity and change since prior examinations. Now here we see a 64 year old woman who had pro poor prognosis of hearing following the placement of the cochlear implant and the axial CT image at the time of presentation show that the electrode array is retracted from its expected location with multiple electrode leads located outside of the cochlea. Follow up imaging after surgical revision shows normal position of the implant with first electrode located approximately 4 millimeters past the round window. Now before we conclude a couple of other advances. Number one, intense high pressure air by pulses is introduced via a Im, Im, uh, an implant that, that is the ventilating tube, high pressure pulses are passed through the ventilating tube or a grommet directly hitting the round window and increasing the pressure there as an attempt to reduce symptoms of Meniere's disease. And this device is called the Miniat syndrome. That's number one. Number two, the round window is exposed in a surgical for tympanoplasty in which sound will hit the round window, pass in the reverse direction and come back into the scalar vestibuli. Now this surgical procedure where the sound process is reversed is called sono inversion. So let us now conclude, numerous acquired and developmental processes may affect the round window presenting with varying clinical symptoms. Such cases can be challenging to radiologists who are unfamiliar with local anatomy and pathologies. Because the round window and round window niche of, are often anatomically obscured during a surgery, imaging plays a uniquely important role. Radiologists therefore should scrutinize the round window and familiarize themselves with anomalies and disease processes that may be encountered in this important anatomic region. A comprehensive overview of the round window.